In the past few years, we have seen some of the biggest names in entertainment taken down. You know, cancelled when their past bad behavior has been made more public for the world to see and to be disgusted with. You already know all their names. They are the usual suspects of perversion. People like Harvey Weinstein, Kevin Spacey, and Bill Cosby have all felt the wrath and the punishment for the years of unchecked, horrendous, abusive behavior finally coming to light. For some, they take a brief hiatus and return almost more popular than ever. I'm looking at you, Louis C.K. For others, they never quite bounce back from the horrendous allegations. We also have to ask the question, is it possible to separate the art from the horrible person who is the artist? You know, an artist filled with sin. Or after the horrendous behavior is exposed, is it hard to watch their movies again? Every case is different, and that is why we must look at this particular case. This time, it's a cinema darling who everyone had so much hope for. This dude helped create and destroy the modern-day superhero movie. But yeah, so now this filmmaker is on the line himself of those usual suspects. So what the f*** happened to Brian Singer? But to truly understand what the fuck happened to Brian Singer, we must begin at the beginning of the beginning began when he was born on his birthday, 1965, New York City. Making films was a passion of his from an early age, where he would make 8mm films while attending high school in New Jersey, before heading off to college where he studied filmmaking at the School of Visual Arts in New York. Then he was transferred over to the famed USC School of Cinematic Arts. Shortly after college, Brian Singer would direct a short film called Lion's Den, which featured his childhood friend Ethan Hawke, and would be edited by future Academy Award winner John Ottman. His short film, Lion's Den, would prove to be a successful endeavor, as after a screening of the film, a Japanese-based production company approached him about funding his next movie. This would lead to 1993's Public Access, which Brian Singer co-wrote with future Oscar winner Christopher McQuarrie. Despite winning the Sundance Film Festival Grand Jury Prize, the $250,000 budgeted film never secured a theatrical release. With the critical success of his first feature-length film, Brian Singer would found his production company Bad Hat Harry Productions. It's an homage to Steven Spielberg's classic film Jaws, when he says, that's a bad hat, Harry. And the first project by this production company would be House M.D., which would list Brian Singer as executive producer for all 176 episodes. Of course, it was his first film under this production company that would truly launch him into the upper echelon of filmmakers. The idea for this film came from the famous line in the movie Casablanca, when the character says, round up the usual suspects. Singer always thought that would be a great title for a movie with the image of a police lineup in his head for the poster. So he had the poster first, now he just needed uh, a movie. All he really had to do was figure out what would bring five notorious felons into one single lineup. Luckily, Christopher McQuarrie had an unpublished screenplay that he was able to fuse together with Brian Singer's idea, and The Usual Suspects was born. The film would release in August 1995, where it would garner strong critical acclaim and an even better box office, pulling in over $67 million off a $6 million budget. The film had an amazing cast, which was so well directed. The dialogue was fresh and fun, you know, like dialogue used to be in the 90s. And the violence was hip and cool, you know, like how violence used to be in the 90s. 
But yeah, when watching The Usual Suspects, you could feel like you were in the hands of a very capable filmmaker, and you just couldn't wait to see what he was gonna do next. And yeah, like I said, these Usual Suspects, they made a lot of money at the box office, and even more impressive than that money was the legacy that this film left behind, as it has one of the best twist endings of all time. And it would go on to be nominated for over 50 awards, including two Academy Award wins for Kevin Spacey. Well, whoever Kaiser Soze is, I can tell you he's going to get gloriously drunk tonight. And the screenplay. While Brian Singer would receive nominations for Best Film at the British Academy Film Awards and Best Director at the Saturn Awards, Brian Singer was the number one hotshot director in showbiz at the time. And this was the 90s, during a time when young hotshot directors were all the rage. Everyone thought that his future was bright, but we would sadly discover that those days of future passed him over because of horrible things. But yeah, we'll get to those horrible things in a little bit. Now back to movies. His next movie would be Apt Pupil. Brian Singer had read the Stephen King novella of the same title, Apt Pupil, when little Brian Singer was only 19 years old, and he had always wanted to make it into a movie. He got a screenwriter to type up a script and presented it to Stephen King, along with a copy of The Usual Suspects, which hadn't been released yet. And Stephen King was so impressed with the script and the movie Usual Suspects, that he optioned the rights to Brian Singer for just one dollar. Unfortunately, the film Apt Pupil was not a big hit with audiences, only recouping around nine million of its 14 million dollar budget. But it would bring him his second Saturn Award nomination for Best Director, while the film would win a Saturn Award for Best Horror Film. And he got to work with Ian McKellen, which he would do again in his next movie. But of course, those films with their critical acclaim meant bigger opportunities for Brian Singer. And he would take the biggest leap of his career when he tackled X-Men in the year 2000. A film that is credited with ushering in the modern day comic book movie revolution. If you don't count Blade. Brian Singer said that he was looking to do a science fiction film at the time, and was actually offered a chance to direct Alien Resurrection, but was ultimately convinced to take on the X-Men movie after the producers explained to him the themes of the X-Men film that they were trying to make. And these themes involved people being prejudiced against others for simply being who they are, something that Singer could relate to because... His sexual orientation is bisexual, in case you were wondering. And so yeah, Brian Singer took experiences he had, uh, feeling like an outsider, feeling like he doesn't belong in the world, and used that very effectively to direct the X-Men movie. Just like with the usual suspects, he was handling an ensemble cast, balancing them all very well, the action is solid, and the suspense and the tension and the drama that Brian Singer was able to bring to this silly little comic book movie was pretty impressive. Especially at the time, because at this time, comic book movies, they were getting no respect. They were still a little too afraid to go full yellow spandex yet, though. What would you prefer? Yellow spandex? This film, X-Men, would open on July 14th, the year 2000 and would ultimately go on to make over $296 million worldwide. Finally, Brian Singer would win a Saturn Award for Best Director, where the film X-Men also picked up awards for Best Science Fiction Film, you know, among others, and had this superhero X-Men movie bombed, had it tanked, had it failed, had it flopped. Even if it had just done okay, it is all but certain that there would be no Marvel Cinematic Universe. So if you like that MCU stuff, you can thank Brian. 
And then Brian Singer would return to the director's chair for what many still hail as one of the finest superhero films ever made. This one was called X2, X-Men United. This sequel was bigger and bolder in every way. Brian Singer would take cues from Empire Strikes Back when it came to crafting the story, which is always a good idea. Ultimately, X2 would earn over $407 million worldwide, with Brian Singer again being nominated for that Saturn Award for Best Director. With the massive success of the X-Men franchise, it was no surprise that 20th Century Fox wanted him to continue to sit in that director's chair. However, a different opportunity came along from a different superhero, and Brian Singer would end up signing with Warner Brothers to take on Superman Returns, leaving those X-Men behind. That decision to abandon the X-Men for DC's Superman did not sit well with Fox, who subsequently canceled their production deal with Brian Singer's company, Bad Hat Harry Productions. The movie Superman Returns would open with a solid five-day gross of 84.6 million, but would quickly begin its decline when its second weekend gross dropped by 58% probably because everyone who went to go see it told everybody else that it was boring. I did like how they would honor and respect and connect to the Christopher Reeve Superman, but they didn't do anything good with it. Superman Returns would make just over $391 million worldwide off of a nearly $223 million budget before marketing cost, which was ultimately seen as a disappointing figure for such a massive, anticipated intellectual property. It's frickin' Superman, it should have made more money. But it's frickin' Superman, so it's not supposed to be boring. After producing the cult classic Trick or Treat in the year 2007, Brian Singer would return to the director's chair to tell a tale of Nazis with Tom Cruise, starring in the true story Valkyrie. This is a fascinating tale of the failed attempt to kill Hitler. They almost got him. The studio decided to release Valkyrie on Christmas Day 2008, where it actually opened to a solid $30 million and would ultimately cap out at just uh, over $201 million worldwide. After taking a little break, 20th Century Fox wanted to recapture the magic of the first two X-Men movies and came crawling back to Brian Singer about directing a new X-Men movie. Brian Singer would write a treatment and give it to a writer to develop, which would ultimately become X-Men First Class. However, as the project took a while to get going, Singer had signed on to direct Jack the Giant Slayer. Its massive production budget was nearly 200 million buckaroos, and every buck was an uphill battle. And the film only made back 197 million worldwide. So what do you do when you have a film that is a financial disappointment? Well, you get back to familiar territory, and that familiar territory is full of mutants. Go fuck yourself. And after the massive success of X-Men First Class, Brian Singer would take over directing duties from Matthew Vaughn, bringing us X-Men Days of Future Past, which would go on to become one of the best films in the X-Men franchise, and the most successful with a $747.9 million gross worldwide. And yeah, it got the best reviews in the history of X-Men movies, with Brian Singer picking up a Saturn Award nomination for Best Director. After producing the well-received horror film, The Taking of Deborah Logan, in 2014, Brian Singer would step back behind the camera for X-Men Apocalypse. Sadly, this film would be called a franchise-killing disaster. X-Men Apocalypse was predicted to open with 80 million, yet only managed 65.8 million before losing 66% of its audience in its second week. And yeah, X-Men Apocalypse, it's a mess of a movie that just, it just, it just, it, 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 what, what's going on here? Nobody cares, and it just didn't make sense with anything. 
despite all of that, the Saturn Award still nominated Brian Singer for Best Director. And then came Bohemian Rhapsody, a movie that had more drama behind the camera than in front of it. Production on this highly anticipated Freddie Mercury biopic had begun in 2017, and it wouldn't be long before there were whispers and rumors about trouble on the set. Then, in December of 2017, it was reported that the production of the film had been temporarily suspended due to what was reported as quote-unquote temporary unavailability of director Brian Singer, with it later being cleared up and reported that Brian Singer simply did not want to return to set after Thanksgiving break. Brian Singer had asked to suspend the production further as his mother was supposedly very ill, but at the time it was reported that people had become annoyed with Brian Singer's behavior, as he was constantly late to set and had frequent clashes with future Oscar winner Rami Malek. And with only two weeks left of production, Brian Singer was formally fired from the film, with director Dexter Fletcher stepping in as his replacement. Despite Fletcher completing the film, the DGA ruled that Singer had done enough to retain the sole director credit. But by that time, the wheels were off of the bus. This once praised and respected director was now making headlines, not for his movies, but for his bad behavior. But the thing is, his bad behavior had actually been a bit of a very well-known secret in Hollywood. Like, even I knew this guy was up to some sketchy stuff. But the cast and crew of Bohemian Rhapsody was like, what? We had no idea, what? I'm like, yeah, y'all, y'all knew. Everybody knew what he was doing, but it was, you know, a time when they could get away with that shit. So yeah, before we get started on the horrible, abusive history of Brian Singer, we should point out that Brian Singer denies all allegations leveled against him and has never faced any criminal charges stemming from any allegation. So I know it's hard to do this on the internet now, but yeah, innocent until proven guilty. But there is a lot of sketchy stuff. Only a few days after Brian Singer was fired from the film, a lawsuit was filed against the director that accused him of sexually assaulting a minor in the year 2003. From there, the floodgates would open and more and more abuse allegations were reported, including ones that had not been private, but were there for anyone to see if they were looking, including a 1997 lawsuit that accused Brian Singer of tricking underage children to film a nude shower scene on the set of Apt Pupil, WTF. In 2014, Brian Singer was sued by former child star Michael Egan III, who claimed that the director drugged and raped him in Hawaii. Singer calls the claims outrageous and false, as it turns out that he was right and Brian Singer's attorney was able to prove to the courts with documents that proved that neither party was even in Hawaii at the time of the events were to have allegedly taken place. Later that year, Brian Singer and producer Gary Goddard were accused of raping a minor at the London premiere of Superman Returns with the case being dismissed at the accuser's request shortly after. But the reports of Singer's notorious sex-filled parties were no secret. It was at these wild and crazy parties where many of these allegations of sexual assault of minors took place. There were always young boys around Brian, and it was always uncomfortable, and something just always felt off about it, like in like a sinister kind of way. In January of 2019, an investigative report by The Atlantic would tell the story of four men who accused Brian Singer of sexual assault. Brian Singer would call the article homophobic, while associations like GLAAD distanced themselves from Brian Singer and his film Bohemian Rhapsody saying that he wrongfully used homophobia to deflect from sexual assault allegations. Other organizations would follow suit, removing Brian Singer's name from any nominations associated with the film Bohemian Rhapsody. 
While other projects Brian Singer had in development, such as a remake of Red Sonja, were shelved. Nobody wanted to make a movie with Brian Singer anymore. But it wouldn't be just Singer's alleged sexual endeavors that made headlines, but his general nasty behavior on set. He would constantly get into arguments with producers and stars of his films. Like there was one time Halle Berry walked off set, and Jennifer Lawrence said that Brian Singer had one of the biggest hissy fits she'd ever seen. And I'm sure J-Law has seen her fair share of hissy fits. So where the f*** is Brian Singer now? He certainly took time off to let the noise die down surrounding those multiple allegations made against him. But it appears that he is now ready to make a comeback. But are we ready? Are you? The filmmaker has reportedly been living slash hiding in Israel, where he's working on three films set in or related to the country, and has reportedly been searching for funding without the aid of an agent. While he's also planning to do a documentary about himself and the allegations leveled against him, and the quote-unquote struggles he has faced in the aftermath. Whether any of these projects see the light of day is still up in the air. But it would appear that after years away from the spotlight, Brian Singer is ready to make his comeback. But the question is, are we? So yeah, you know what, it's okay to give a fuck about what the fuck happened to Brian Singer because, you know, there's a lesson there. And that lesson is don't do bad things, especially with minors. The best use of the skills and talent and humor and, um, cruelty of comedian Andy Dick was on full display in MTV's The Assistant. That's how it is here in Hollyweird. You get cut out. On the surface, this reality show appears to be, you know, your typical trashy MTV reality program. But actually, it is a hilarious, brilliant satire of shows like The Bachelor, The Real World, The Apprentice, America's Next Top Model, The Weakest Link, Survivor, American Idol, and more. Andy Dick was able to show Holly Weird's ugly face to perfection, and he used his own ugly Face to get the point across. This dude turned an MTV reality show for frickin' teenagers into performance art. Mr. Dick should have single-handedly ended this particular genre of television, but no, his joke was too funny. Too funny for the world to truly understand. And these types of shows continue on to this very day. I still crack up every time I think of Andy Dick screaming, This reality show is ruining my life! This reality show is ruining my life! With that one line, I was like, okay, I, I get the joke. This isn't actually real, but everyone around Andy thinks it's real, and he's just with him, which is uh, what Andy Dick does best with people. And the best part about this MTV show, The Assistant, is that the contestants take it so seriously. They have no idea that they are the joke. And yeah, like I said, Andy just fucks with them the whole time, breaking hearts, breaking dreams, and literally breaking material things. And yes, he pushes it to the point of abuse, but it's the funny kind of abuse that was totally okay back then. Until the day that Andy pushed his outrageousness too far into the realm of criminal. I'm having a not such a good day. I'm glad you guys are. I'm not. So what can be said about Andy Dick? that the paparazzi and nearly every judge from West Virginia to Los Angeles hasn't already said. He was once a rising star in the comedy world, with lovable nerdy characters on hit TV shows, before his demons grabbed a hold of him and took him down an over 25 year path of endless headlines, with his name oftentimes preceding the word arrested. Am I a drug dealer? No, I am not. Thank you for asking, though. 
In those years, he has compiled more mug shots than headshots, and went from star on the rise to registered sex offender. Yeah, so, uh, I don't know how else to say this other than, what the f happened to Andy Dick? She's no more questions! It. Wake up, bitch! But to truly understand what the f*** happened to Andy Dick, we must begin at the beginning and the beginning began when he was born on his birthday, 1965, South Carolina. Of course, Andy Dick was the class clown, and even gave himself the name Super Dick, which actually led to him being voted prom king. After graduating high school in the suburbs of Illinois, Andy Dick would study at the famed Second City and Improv Olympic Studio in Chicago, while also attending university. You can't get emancipated to live on the street. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Andy would land a few bit parts on short-lived sitcoms, such as the Jamie Lee Curtis, Richard Lewis starring Anything But Love, and the Matthew Perry show Sydney. This was before Friends. But then, Andy Dick would land his breakout role as a sketch player on the Emmy-winning The Ben Stiller Show. Despite the show being canceled far too soon, this hilarious sketch comedy show was a true launching pad for all of the talent involved, especially for the show's namesake, Ben Stiller, who really enjoyed working with Andy Dick so much that he gave him a role on his directorial debut film, Reality Bites, in 1994. You're gonna make copies for me many copies. After having memorable guest spots on The Late Show with David Letterman and The Nanny, Andy would land a co-lead role opposite Polly Shore, who was in demand at the time, in the film In the Army Now, also in 1994. I must say, though, this guy sounds really nice. He's got a villa right on the Adriatic Sea. Jack, don't rub it in. This was followed by a small part in the video game adaptation Double Dragon, also in 1994. 1994, the year of the dick. But then came 1995, which was also considered the year of the dick, when Andy's career took off. After appearing in the rebooted Get Smart series, Andy would land a starring role in the NBC series show News Radio, opposite comedy legends Dave Foley, Stephen Root, and Phil Hartman. The series would run for five seasons, yet was never a ratings juggernaut, but it was consistent and garnered solid reviews, which kept it on the air. During this time, Andy Dick would have brief appearances in several projects, including the Ben Stiller directed The Cable Guy, a Sarah Silverman mockumentary called Who's the Caboose, a movie called Best Men, and he would even appear in a Sheryl Crow music video, while also getting his start in the world of voice acting with spots on Johnny Bravo and Jumanji. Yes, that's right, there was a Jumanji cartoon. It was during this time that Andy's demons began to take hold of him. He would attend AA meetings with his good friend Chris Farley, who was actually Andy Dick's sponsor at the time. But when Chris Farley passed away from a drug overdose in 1997, Andy Dick began to slide even further into his addictions. It is around this time that it is alleged that Andy Dick went to a Christmas party at Phil Hartman's house, where he and Phil Hartman's wife, Bryn, who had been sober for 10 years at the time, allegedly did cocaine with Andy Dick. That event involving Andy Dick and his cocaine is believed to have led Bryn Hartman to relapse, which would result in her murdering her husband, Phil Hartman, in 1998 while high on cocaine before turning the gun on herself. While many don't outright blame Andy Dick for this tragic event, one person has long held the belief that if Andy Dick hadn't gone to that Christmas party, Phil Hartman would still be alive. And that person is comedian John Lovitz, who took over for Phil Hartman on news radio after his tragic death. The animosity between John Lovitz and Andy Dick was so bad that one day on set, Andy told Lovitz that he shouldn't be there, to which Lovitz replied, 
Well, I wouldn't be here if you hadn't give Bren coke in the first place. The show was canceled shortly after this feud and has continued ever since, with Andy Dick one time approaching John Lovitz in a restaurant and saying to him, I put the Phil Hartman hex on you. You're gonna die next. You're the next to die. Then later that year, John Lovitz reportedly shoved Andy Dick's head into a bar several times, bang, 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 at the famed Laugh Factory until security guards could separate them. And sadly, this would not be the only death of a news radio cast member that Andy would be associated with. In March 1999, Andy and actor David Strickland flew to Las Vegas and spent three days partying it up in Sin City. And after that three-day bender, David Strickland, while intoxicated, hung himself in his motel room. And Andy would be later questioned about the events surrounding Strickland's death. These tragic events in his life would lead Andy Dick down a spiral that began with his first run-in with the law. On May 15, 1999, when he crashed his car into a utility pole and was arrested for felony cocaine possession, with the charges being dismissed after he completed an 18-month drug program. Program. Don't do drugs. And this would be the beginning of Andy Dick becoming more infamous for his off-screen shenanigans than his on-screen ones. He was never a leading star, but you could always count on him to show up in a small role and completely knock it out of the park. You have to admit, this is a comedian, this is an actor, this is a performer, this is an artist who is willing to push things well beyond the limit for the sake of a laugh or a tear. But yeah, no matter what, Andy Dick was always a scene stealer. Like, he pretty much steals every scene he's in. You don't hang up on me, okay? You don't call me and hang up on me. Such as all of his roles in movies like Bong Water, Advice from a Caterpillar, The Lion King 2 Simba's Pride, the English dub of Castle in the Sky. And he would have some pretty solid cameo spots in movies such as Permanent Midnight, Inspector Gadget, Loser, Road Trip, for which he would be nominated for a Teen Choice Award for Choice Sleaze Bag, as well as an MTV Movie Award nomination for Best Cameo in Dude, Where's My Car? Don't hose me. Maybe later. Oh yeah, and he was also in Zoolander. Can't forget Zoolander. Ben Stiller really likes working with Andy Dick. Mr. Andy would remain out of trouble long enough, just long enough, to launch his own MTV comedy show titled The Andy Dick Show in 2001, which would earn him his second Teen Choice Award for Choice TV Personality. Andy Dick is teaching kids the value of hard work. I guess that's a crime, huh? Isn't it America? And of course, this was followed by appearing in several other projects such as Family Guy, Clone High, the ABC sitcom Less Than Perfect, as well as back on the big screen in small roles such as voicing Lenny the Weasel in Doctor Doolittle 2, and an uncredited cameo in Old School, which uh, I don't even want to talk about his scene, but you know, you know what it is, and you know you laughed, you dirty, dirty fool, you did. Way to give 110%. In 2004, Andy Dick was back in the headlines, not for voicing Maurice in Grand Theft Auto San Andreas, but for his less than savory behavior, for he was arrested in 2004 for mooning people at a McDonald's, which actually is kind of funny, but it's a slippery slope. No, that's not what it looks like. Maybe a little bit. How was your nap? Shut up! Andy would then be invited to take part in the Comedy Central roast of Pamela Anderson, where he would proceed to grope the honoree several times. And there's like photographic evidence of this, I think, around the web if you want to search the World Wide Web. And also, apparently, there's evidence of him licking people's faces for no other reason than he thinks it's funny. And apparently, he also did this several times during the Comedy Central roast of William Shatner. 
No, no, no. What this does is it brings us one step closer to living in the dumpster. While in 2007, Andy was a guest on Jimmy Kimmel Live, where he had to be forcibly removed from the show after touching fella guest Ivanka Trump several times. But it wasn't just on TV that Andy was being a professional nuisance. In 2005, he would perform stand-up in Alberta, Canada, where he would drop his pants to an unsuspecting audience, revealing all of that stuff underneath Andy Dick's pants. Whatever may be there. A pantsless Andy Dick was quickly ushered off the stage, and all of the remaining shows were cancelled. The following year, Andy would call the audience at his stand-up show The N-Word, you know the one, and he would be forced to issue an apology. But not long after, he would go on a radio show and call Howard Stern some extremely anti-Semitic things. Oh my goodness, Andy Dick, you just... Just <laughs> piss everybody off, don't you? Stop hanging up on me. Both of you. He equally offends everybody, right? Maybe? No. Okay. And sure, despite all this, Andy would continue to pop up on our screens in things like Arrested Development, ER, CSI, Community, Legit, Two Broke Girls, The Simpsons, and he also directed a film called Blonde Ambition in 2007. He appeared in something called The Comebacks, and even made a very interesting cameo as himself in Judd Apatow's Funny People. And of course, Ben Stiller just loves this guy and keeps putting him in movies, so he was in Zoolander 2. Working with Ben Stiller was like working with Genghis Khan, okay? But his personal life had now fully overshadowed his professional one. In 2008, he was arrested again for drug possession and sexual battery after pulling down the top of a 17-year-old girl outside of Buffalo Wild Wings. He pleaded guilty to a misdemeanor battery and marijuana charge and was given three years of probation and was ordered to wear an alcohol bracelet that would monitor his alcohol intake for a year. But sadly, it it would be just two years later when Andy would be arrested again in West Virginia on charges of sexual abuse after he reportedly groped a bartender and a patron. After a six month delay, the judge showed him some mercy and said that if he could stay out of trouble for six months, the charges would be dropped, which he did. However, the two victims would later file civil suits against the actor. In 2009, Andy Dick would appear on the VH1 reality show, Sober House, which he seemed to genuinely have a desire to get clean. But not long after, he would be back to his old ways, drunkenly showcasing his body to people who did not want it to be showcased to them in such ways, such as the time in 2010 when he exposed himself outside Cafe Audrey in Hollywood, or at the 2011 Newport Beach Film Festival where he exposed himself before urinating on a backdrop. Later that year, he would be sued by an audience member at one of his comedy shows after Andy rubbed his genitals on the man's face. So yeah, Andy Dick, he feels like he can just touch whoever he wants wherever he wants, anytime he wants. And at the 2011 AVN Awards, he reportedly groped and stalked adult film actresses. In 2016, we would get a brief glimpse at the real Andy Dick when he posted a 20-minute video from the bedside of his dying brother. The video was a heartbreaking glimpse into the life him and his brother had endured and how his early life had taken a toll on him as an adult. The video doesn't offer an excuse for his behavior, but it gives you an insight on why Andy Dick has had trouble staying sober all these years. He's like the definition of a sad clown. But sadly, in 2017, he would be back to his old ways. Andy Dick would be fired from a role on the independent film Raising Buchanan after allegations of groping people's genitals and unwanted kissing and licking of several crew members came out. That same month, he would be fired from a role in a film called Vampire Dad 
for, you know, the exact same things. Hmm. Bon voyage, bitch. It would seem in 2019, Andy had met his match when he allegedly tried groping a man who then punched Andy in the head so hard that he had to go to the hospital and be monitored for a brain bleed. Somebody finally struck back. Later that year, after the Me Too movement came into full effect, a paparazzi video came out of Andy Dick outside a restaurant, drunk, of course, and they were asking him about the Me Too scandals, you know, Harvey Weinstein and Kevin Spacey, and of course, Andy Dick made light of the situation. But then things got a bit serious when Andy gets candid with a camera woman after threatening to grope her, tearfully admitting that he contemplates committing suicide every day. This was another rare glimpse into a man who is completely out of control and is fighting lots of demons inside. I'm not arguing, I'm not arguing, I'm not arguing, I'm not arguing this with you right now. I don't want to argue with you ever. His friends in the industry, from Ben Stiller to Judd Apatow, keep pulling for their friend, with Judd even casting him in the TV series Love to play a fictionalized version of himself who desperately yearns to be clean and sober. There was even a documentary made about him titled Everybody Has an Andy Dick Story that was due to premiere at the Chicago Comedy Film Festival in 2022, but was pulled from release when Andy Dick was yet again arrested, this time with a full live stream of the arrest while living in an RV park for felony sexual battery. Andy was never a performer who was at the top of the call sheet, but he was someone you could always count on for a decent laugh. His most successful characters had him playing his nerdy persona, and he was the butt of the joke most of the time. But behind the scenes was a person who had to fight his demons, combined with his headline-making heartbreak that only made his demons get worse. He was a person who thinks he's being funny when the rest of the world stopped laughing long ago. Wait a minute though, my childhood sucked! But it is telling that even in this episode, the bulk of this has been spent talking about his misdeeds and not his work. Like, I wish I could go into great detail talking about his performance in Sharknado 2, or even Employee of the Month, or his hilarious guest spot on Workaholics, and whatever he was doing on Sense8. There's still so much more to talk about, and I, we, didn't, we don't even have time to go through all of his legal troubles. From stealing power tools to even more sexual assaults, with the most recent happening in January of 2023, when he was arrested for public intoxication and failure to register as a sex offender, something that he became after being found guilty of groping an Uber driver in 2022. And even the time that he almost died from snorting fentanyl, which he thought was cocaine. Don't do drugs, everybody. It could be fentanyl. It's probably fentanyl. Don't, just assume every drug from now on is fentanyl. F fentanyl. There is just so much to report on him that it would be a feature length fing video. But the overarching story of Andy Dick is that of a man who seems to have lost touch with reality a long time ago. Probably when he was making that reality show, yeah, he lost touch of reality and didn't know what was real anymore and it just spiraled and he just became a monster. But is it possible for him to one day get all of this figured out and get his life back on track? You know what? I, I believe in Andy Dick. I wish and I pray and I hope the best for him. Anything is possible, and yeah, everyone here at Joe Blow, we genuinely hope that Andy Dick gets better. Because we know that when Andy Dick puts in the work, he has proven that he can be an entertaining person. And yeah, we genuinely like to end these videos, these episodes, these video essays, these, what do you, what do you call these things now? But yeah, we, we like to end these on a happy note and, you know, like to say, and you shouldn't give a fuck about what the fuck happened to this person because they are doing fine, but I just can't really say that this time because I'm not really sure Andy Dick is doing fine and you kind of should give a fuck.
about what's happening to him because, because yeah, there's a lesson there. And we really hope that this story has a happy ending. And you know what? If you follow him on Instagram, it looks like he's doing okay. But you know, that's Instagram. You, you filter out the sadness, right? <laughs> right? But yeah, apparently, according to this, he's doing better than the headlines want us to believe. But I, I don't know if I believe that. I want to, though. But yeah, hopefully after all of these decades, Andy can get his stuff together, and hopefully one day we can forgive him, and he can make some good movies and TV shows again, right? So yeah, that's what the f**k happened to Andy Dick. Be careful, Andy, seriously. Thanks for trying. And can you get me some coffee? Once upon a time, there was a sweet little child named Brian Hugh Warner. Brian would attend his Christian school while dreaming of working as a music journalist. Later in life, Brian would use these religious images that he learned about in his upbringing to spread joy. <laughs> to legions of fans around the world. This Brian Hugh Warner sure sounds like an outstanding citizen. He would even one day become a reverend, but not to the Church of Christ, but rather to the Church of Satan. Oh yeah, and Brian Hugh Warner would change his name to Marilyn Manson. So it's time to find out what the f happened to Marilyn Manson. 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 But to truly understand what the fuck happened to Marilyn Manson, we must begin at the beginning, and the beginning began when he was born on his birthday, Ohio, 1969. With his strict Christian upbringing, Warner grew up with a deep appreciation for all of the things he wasn't allowed to enjoy, such as metal music. His family would relocate to Florida, where he went to community college while working towards a degree in journalism. One of his early writing gigs was for the Florida-based music magazine, 25th Parallel, where he would interview several prominent artists. This music journalist would then decide to become a musician and change his name to Marilyn Manson combining the first name of Marilyn Monroe and the last name of Charlie Manson, Marilyn Manson. Because Marilyn Monroe, her image represents positive, nice little things, right? And the image of Charles Manson represents horrible, evil, violent, deadly things. So when you bring those two names together, you create this guy right here, Marilyn Manson. I found that Marilyn Monroe and Charles Manson, about five years ago when I thought of this, were the two most memorable people from the 60s. Marilyn Manson would then put together a band called Marilyn Manson and the Spooky Kids, who would quickly gain a following in Southern Florida due to their musical talent and their bizarre stage antics, like crucifying naked women and having children in cages? What the f***? The Marilyn Manson and the Spooky Kids shows would constantly sell out, and they would sign with Sony Music shortly after, although Sony would quickly take back their offer. But Manson would use the money they earned to record more demos, while shortening the band's name to just Marilyn Manson. Sorry, Spooky Kids. Those demos would attract Trent Reznor of Nine Inch Nails, who would sign the band Marilyn Manson to his vanity label, Nothing Records, which was a part of Interscope Records. Trent Reznor would also produce their debut album, Portrait of an American Family, in 1994. After the release of this album, Portrait of an American Family, Manson and his band would work on an EP that was originally meant to just be remixes of the song Dope Hat, but once all the pieces fell into place, they had an album with several covers, most notably the cover of Sweet Dreams, which would produce an MTV Video Music Award nomination and would be Marilyn Manson's big break into mainstream popularity. 
Marilyn Manson said that the idea to cover the song Sweet Dreams came to him when he was tripping on LSD at a party and the song Sweet Dreams came on. And because of all of the illegal drugs up in Marilyn Manson's brain, he started to hallucinate a slower, meaner version of this dance classic. Of course, the album's themes of child abuse, drug abuse, domestic abuse, psychological abuse, just, just abuse in general, anything you can abuse. That was the, the theme of, of the album. It was met with plenty of pushback from parental groups and conservative lawmakers who said that the lyrics in this EP celebrated some of the most antisocial and immoral behaviors imaginable, while saying that the record labels who sold this type of music had the blood of children on their hands. The EP would chart at number 31 on the Billboard Top 100 and be certified platinum. So it was around this time that we would start to see Marilyn Manson t-shirts pop up on all the scary gothic metal kids walking around in the hallways of school. You know how it was. There were some kids in Limp Biscuit shirts, some kids in corn shirts, but the baddest of the bad metalhead kids displayed Marilyn Manson on their wardrobe. And depending on what kind of kid you were, these Marilyn Manson t-shirts would kinda help you know which kids you wanted to hang out with and which kids you, you didn't, depending on what kind of kid you were back in the 90s and stuff. I recently saw a meme, which was a meme about how we didn't need memes back in the day, or social media in general. The meme goes on to joke about how we were able to spread the rumor around the world that Marilyn Manson had removed some of his ribs so that he could, you know, blank his, his blank. Marilyn, his, his, his Manson. Then all we needed was word of mouth to share these untruths. It's not true, right? Like, he didn't really do that, right? People are that stupid. Exactly. But of course, all of this controversy would only help Marilyn Manson as his next album, 1996's Antichrist Superstar, would be met with even more of an outcry from religious groups and politicians. The formation of the album was reportedly exhaustive as Manson and the rest of the band, the artists formerly known as the Spooky Kids, would deprive themselves of sleep while going on massive drug benders as a way to help create an album that felt violent and hostile. They would choose the song The Beautiful People as their lead single, and this single would garner enough fandom that when the album was released, in October of 1996, it debuted at number 3 on the Billboard 200, on its way to selling over 7 million copies worldwide, with Rolling Stone magazine awarding them the Best New Artist Award. The band would embark on a tour to promote the album that was picketed at every city by religious groups. If we believe that all who hear Manson tomorrow night will go out and commit violent acts, Manson would get his first taste of the big screen when he appeared in David Lynch's Lost Highway in 1997. He played a character called Porno Star Number One. Then he would appear opposite his then girlfriend Rose McGowan in the 1999 movie Jawbreaker, where he would play a character called The Stranger. Soon after those cinematic appearances, Marilyn Manson would release his next album, Mechanical Animals in 1998 that featured such hit tracks as the Grammy-nominated The Dope Show, Rock is Dead, which was featured on the soundtrack to The Matrix, and the controversial ditty titled I Don't Like the Drugs, But the Drugs Like Me. And once again, it seemed like all of that controversy had paid off, as the album would debut at number one. 
on the Billboard 200 charts. The album was meant as a bridge between their first album, Antichrist Superstar, and their next album, Hollywood, and would represent a shift away from industrial metal to more of a mix of 1970s glam rock and electronic music. The cover of the album, Mechanical Animals, would feature Marilyn Manson as some sort of androgynous, naked character named Omega. He had, like, boy and girl parts all, all over him. And this would be named one of the 50 greatest album covers of all time by several publications for some reason. Of course, despite the high praise, retailers like Kmart, Walmart, and Target all refused to sell the album due to its controversial packaging. We're all stars now in the dope show. It would seem like Marilyn Manson was on top of the world, at least the world of rock and roll, but it would all hit mass hysteria on April 20th, 1999 when two very disturbed, very cowardly high school kids entered the halls of Columbine High School and mercilessly killed 12 people while wounding 24 others. In the aftermath of this horrible shooting, the media had to push blame on to something or someone, so the media and religious groups and politicians, who all hated Manson and his music since day one, used this opportunity to place blame on him and his lyrics and onstage antics, saying that all of this influenced these people to commit this horrendous act of violence. Headlines littered the airwaves, such as Killers Worshipped Rock Freak Manson and Devil Worshipping Maniac Told Kids to Kill. This continued even after it was reported that the two shooters were not even fans of Marilyn Manson's music. But because of all of this, the band would ultimately suspend the last five days of their tour out of respect for those affected by this tragedy. But of course, none of that mattered because Marilyn Manson was still labeled the one responsible for this horrific tragedy, something that he has opened up about in the years since, most notably while appearing in the Michael Moore documentary Bowling for Columbine, saying that he felt like a scapegoat for an unexplainable tragedy, and he surprisingly came off as a well-spoken, thoughtful individual. If you were to talk directly to the to the kids at Columbine or the people in that community, what, what, would, what would you say to them if they were here right now? I wouldn't say a single word to them. I would listen to what they have to say, and that's what no one did. It would seem like this controversy did take its toll on his album sales, as his next album, in the year 2000, called Holy Wood, would take the controversy of the Columbine tragedy head on, with a track titled The Nobodies. However, the album would only peak at number 13 on the Billboard 200, despite releasing their biggest international hit ever, with the cover of Gloria Jones's hit Tainted Love, which would be featured on the Not Another Teen Movie soundtrack, which every teen had. By the year 2002, Manson would start to look to change things up a bit. He would start this off by collaborating on the score for the big screen adaptation of Resident Evil. Then he would appear in front of the camera in a surprisingly good performance in the true life crime story Party Monster, alongside Macaulay Culkin, before releasing his next album, The Golden Age of Grotesque which would see Manson experiment with swing and burlesque music, combined with his established dark and heavy metal roots. But of course, this strange combination of musical genres seemed to pay off as the album would debut at number one on the Billboard 200. But it still pushed those boundaries, you know, the boundaries that Marilyn Manson likes to push, all the ones that you would expect, as the album featured artwork of a young child holding a gun. This album, The Golden Age of Grotesque, would produce several hit songs, including This Is The New Shite, 
which was featured on the Matrix Reloaded soundtrack. After releasing a best of album titled Lest We Forget, which also featured a new cover of Depeche Mode's Personal Jesus, Manson would take a bit of a hiatus from music, as he would pursue other artistic interests. He would appear on TV shows such as Californication and Eastbound and Down, while providing the voice of the Shadow in ABC's fantasy series Once Upon a Time. Manson would also, at times, poke fun at his own persona, showing that he has a sense of humor when he voiced himself on MTV's Celebrity Deathmatch, which actually launched an episode featuring Charlie Manson versus Marilyn Manson. By the year 2005, Marilyn Manson seemed to be completely disillusioned with the music industry. He just wanted to make art. So then Marilyn Manson would venture back into the world of cinema. Well, he would try. Mr. Manson would express great interest in playing Willy Wonka in Tim Burton's rebooted Charlie and the Chocolate Factory movie, but as you know, the role eventually went to Johnny Depp, who says that he used Marilyn Manson as an inspiration for the character. And you know what? Johnny Depp actually loved the idea of Marilyn Manson playing Willy Wonka so much that he was willing to step down from the role and give it to Manson. But, uh... The studio executives weren't too sure about that. And during this time, Manson was trying to put together a film of his own, a theatrical film titled Phantasmagoria, The Visions of Lewis Carroll, where Marilyn Manson would play the Alice in Wonderland writer. However, this film has been burning alive in development hell since 2004. Oh, I don't care. Well, you should care. Then in 2007, the 36-year-old Marilyn Manson went public with his relationship to actress Evan Rachel Wood, who was around 18 at the time. Of course, this odd couple confused everyone, everything, everywhere all at once. Evan Rachel Wood apparently led a fairly sheltered life and once she was introduced to the world of uh, Holly Weird, this young woman felt like she needed to break free and rebel, like really rebel, and she cranked that rebellion up to f***ing 11. One should not just go from sweet, innocent child to being Marilyn Manson's girlfriend. And later, Evan would say that she was quote-unquote horrifically abused by Manson for years. This included torture, rape, and sexual grooming. Allegedly. We have to say allegedly, and uh, we'll talk about this more later. This person made me feel like we were going to go on this great adventure of freedom and, you know, <laughs> experimentation, and it was... It was very, very far from that. It was the opposite of freedom. So yeah, and until then, let's uh, just go back to the good old days of 2007. Because yeah, in 2007, Marilyn Manson would pop up in small roles in films such as Rise, Blood Hunter, while also showing his comedic chops in shows such as Tim and Eric's Awesome Show and The Soup. Marilyn Manson would eventually land larger roles when he had a six-episode stint on the show Sons of Anarchy, and that would help him land the lead role in an independent film called Street Level, which was directed by the Sons of Anarchy member David Labrava. This was followed by appearing in the short-lived show Salem, and in 2020 you could see him as himself in the hit series The Two Popes, opposite Jude Law and John Malkovich, while he would voice the smiling man in the X-Men spin-off movie The New Mutants. And he would appear in two episodes of the hit series American Gods. He was working hard, doing lots of stuff. Oh. So, who are you? But music was always Manson's first love. And although he hasn't had a number one album since 2003's The Golden Age of Grotesque, he has continued to release a new album every two to three years, with each album debuting on the top ten of that Billboard 200. And his last release, 
was 2020's We Are Chaos, which actually hit number one in Australia. So Marilyn Manson's really big in Australia. This dude has collaborated with some of the biggest names in music history, such as Nine Inch Nails, Eminem, Elton John, and Kanye West, receiving his fifth Grammy nomination as a featured artist on Kanye's album Donda. I talk to God every day, that's my bestie. But yeah, Marilyn Manson is a controversial figure, with many of those controversies having to do with his onstage persona, including threatening journalists, writing controversial songs like I Want to Kill You Like They Do in the Movies, a song he wrote about his ex-girlfriend Evan Rachel Wood, but he has also been the focus of much more serious accusations in his personal life, such as when Wood testified before Congress about her experience with domestic and sexual abuse. At the time, she didn't name any names, but we all knew who she was talking about. And in 2021, she wrote on an Instagram post that her abuser's name, allegedly, is Brian Warner, also known to the world as Marilyn Manson. This was after a few other anonymous women accused Marilyn Manson of sexual harassment, something the Los Angeles Attorney's Office declined to pursue as the claims went uncorroborated, which Manson has categorically denied, saying that this is all just made up and greatly exaggerated. But the allegations were enough for Manson's record label, agency, and manager to drop him and the show American Gods would edit him out of an upcoming episode. Even though Manson maintained that Wood's allegations were distorted and that all of his relationships have been consensual between like-minded partners. So, uh, yeah, what do you think? Who do, who do you believe? Uh, fight about it in the comments. Comment your comment in the comments below. I'll make sure no one breaks his heart. So yeah, from 2021 through 2022, several women came forward alleging weird and abusive details about their relationships with Marilyn Manson. In November of 2021, the L.A. County Sheriff's Department even raided his house with no arrest ever being made. Several women sued the artist, with most being dismissed, although one was settled out of court. But things took a very weird turn on February of 2023 when one of Manson's accusers, Ashley Morgan Smithline, who was featured on a People magazine cover with the headline, I Survived a Monster, came out and said that her allegations against Marilyn Manson were made up and that she was manipulated by Evan Rachel Wood and others who told her to make up these accusations against the shock rocker. Wow, who do you who do you believe now? I don't I don't even know. Uh oh, jeez. Since then there have been no other allegations leveled against Marilyn Manson. However, Manson has remained quiet on all fronts, simply writing on Twitter in March 2022 that there will come a time when I can share more about the events of the past year. Until then, I'm going to let the facts speak for themselves. And actually very recently, like a few days ago, like while we were making this freaking video essay, news broke that Evan Rachel Wood is giving up custody of her son out of fear for her family's safety after an alleged threat from Marilyn Manson. So it seems like this is still an ongoing drama, and we can only hope and pray that it ends well. Everything happens for a reason, and I believe that more now than ever. Marilyn Manson launched into the public world as a controversial person. I keep having to say that word, don't I? Controversial. But yeah, he created this image that he has cultivated and exploited throughout the years. His music and persona has made him an easy target for some people who, uh, you know, like to target people. But Manson has always taken it in stride 
and continue to do what he wants to do. Like, he doesn't give an F. And you know what that F stands for? It stands for fuck. When he is attacked publicly, he just leans into it even harder on his next album. But it appears like his outlandish persona isn't exactly contained to the stage. Despite denying any abuse allegations, he does admit to engaging in things with like-minded individuals that may be out of the normal, you know, freaky, freaky, freaky stuff. <laughs> Unfortunately, right now we can't really say what is true and what isn't. But you can comment your comments in the comments. Marilyn Manson is an entertainer of the highest order who puts on memorable shows for his legions of dedicated fans. Like those kids who were wearing Marilyn Manson shirts walking around in my middle school, they still are to this day. And you know what? I'm not the biggest Marilyn Manson fan. I like, you know, like four of his songs a lot. And when I hear those songs on the radio, the stations that still play him, you know what? I crank it up and I still rock out to this bad boy. But just how bad is he? Uh, only time will tell. Let's hope it's, it's, it's not too bad. So now as we await the next chapter of this dark, twisted saga, I can only just, you know, think that it's okay to give a f about what the f happened to Marilyn Manson because there's a lesson in there somewhere. Lots of lessons, actually, like uh, the dangers of rock and roll and things like that, and, and, you know, the lesson that you probably shouldn't date Marilyn Manson, or you should really, you know, like, really, really look into it and before you uh, go into a committed relationship with this man. But yeah, um, yeah, all there's left to say is what the f***.